I think that the most biting and painful criticism anyone could ever offer a faithful Christian would be to call that person a hypocrite. Because being called a hypocrite basically means all of your devotion to the Lord is false. It's all empty. It's all for show. You put on a good outward show, but underneath you're not following it at all. And it basically invalidates everything that we as Christians are trying to do. And we also remember that Jesus had tremendous mercy on repentant sinners. But he was very hard on hypocrites, and he called the chief priests and the Pharisees hypocrites because he says it was all for show. They claimed to be following the Lord, but they weren't really doing it. It was all an act, if you will. And Jesus came down very hard on them for that. And so if someone calls us a a hypocrite, that's a biting criticism. But in fairness, we have to look carefully because a lot of times people will throw that word around very flippantly. They'll call anybody a hypocrite. And hypocrisy is not what a lot of people try to claim it is. So what does it mean to be a hypocrite? A hypocrite is not a devout Christian who commits a sin. That's just a sinner. Somebody who's trying very hard but falls to human weakness. Well, that's all of us. You and I all do that. And so we're not hypocrites when we commit a sin. A hypocrite is somebody who claims to be devout but then persists in beliefs or practices that repeatedly contradict that whole call to devotion to the Lord, everything the Lord teaches. And so people would say, you claim to be holy and devout, but you're not following it. You're doing things that are totally contradictory to that. You're not living it out. You're not even trying to live it out. You're not a repentant sinner. And if somebody points out the fault or the weakness to them, they get defensive and give themselves reasons why it's okay for me to do this or believe that, even though it blatantly contradicts the gospel call to holiness. That's what a hypocrite is. And we want to be sure, of course, the message today that Jesus was very strong on the uh, chief priests and the elders to whom he was addressing this uh, parable, not to fall into the sin of hypocrisy, of being like the second brother in the story that says yes to God, but doesn't do his will. And why Jesus says even tax collectors and prostitutes were entering heaven before them, because even though they had committed great sins, they repented at the words of John the Baptist. And the chief priests, the Pharisees, were supposed to be the ones leading people to follow God and uh, get them to leave their sins behind, and they weren't doing that. And yet when John the Baptist came along and got them to do that, instead of rejoicing and saying, oh, isn't it wonderful, these sinners have repented, they got indignant, they got annoyed at John. Why would he even bother with people like that? And they didn't believe in John even when they saw he was doing God's work. And that's what made them hypocrites. And that's, again, what you and I want to try to avoid in our lives. Anything that looks like we are, in fact, hypocrites. Because that would be the biggest turnoff to anyone else that we're trying to bring into the faith. And, of course, that is our duty as Christians, is to try to bring other people to Christ. That's our call to evangelization that the Lord gave the apostles at his ascension. Go out and make disciples of all the nations. And who's going to follow a bunch of people who say one thing and repeatedly do another? And one place where we have to make sure that we are especially keen about not being hypocritical is in our respect for human life. Today is, of course, Respect Life Sunday. And we talk about respecting life in all of its forms, in everything from natural conception to natural death. Of course, when we talk about respect life, the first issue that usually comes to mind is abortion, and perhaps rightly so because it's the most critical of all the issues with the millions of abortions that are taking place in our country every year. Of course, we realize that is the paramount issue. And we've made great strides in fighting abortion in our world. When a little over a year ago, Roe versus Wade was overturned, that was a great step for us because immediately nearly half the state started passing laws to try to ban abortion, at least in some part, if not in the entirety of a pregnancy. So we have made some great progress, but we still have a long way to go to try to remind people that every human life is precious and nobody has the right to decide who lives and who dies. And we have to have a consistent life ethic that respects every human life, not just certain human lives, but all lives, from natural conception to natural death. So, 
When we've put into place the motions that lead to the conception of a child, we must not deliberately block it by contracepting that life or, of course, killing it when the life comes along in the womb. Also, people who are handicapped, who are you know, not of the same ability as others. Well, we can't decide, well, why should that person live and take you know, food or attention from other people who are able to give more? No, that person, has life has value. An elderly person who is dying, maybe in, although I hate the expression, what they call a vegetative state, maybe they're in a coma or in a situation where they're not responsive to anything, and people would say, oh, well, just kill them, euthanasia, and, and you know, save that hospital bed for somebody that maybe can use it to get better. No. The bottom line is none of us here ever asked to be born. God asked that we bo- to be born. He has placed us here. Only God can create a life. And only God can take a life. So every life must be respected. No matter how uh, threatening its existence may be, no matter how unwanted it may be, no matter how uh, handicapped it may be, no matter how elderly it may be, no matter how criminal it may be, even the death penalty. I remember somebody saying once, you know, which makes perfect sense, why do we kill people who kill people to show that it's wrong to kill people? Well, of course, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The only exception, of course, we would all know is in the case of legitimate self-defense. If somebody is trying to kill someone and the only way they can prevent that person from killing them is to kill them in return, well, then they're defending and respecting their own individual life because even our own lives need to be respected. And so that's the rare case, um, exception to when it would be okay to take another human life. Technically, the word that we, the commandment says is not you shall not kill, but you shall not murder. You shall not take a life unjustly. And so we need to have that complete and consistent life ethic from natural conception to natural death. And one of the places in the pro-life movement that we need to do is to make sure that we do that, especially with those who don't agree with us. One of the things I have always been very proud of in the pro-life movement is the way that we have made our statement very strongly defended life, but always charitably and prayerfully, without the anger that so many other people in so many other places in life do. But every once in a while, somebody comes up who has not remembered that lesson. And I remember a woman, for example, I worked with many years ago who was, did a lot of work for the pro-life movement, and she was great. But I think all of her arguing with other people who were pro-abortion and everything you know, just jaded her, and she got very angry with it. And it turned her into an angry woman in everything she did, even around the parish. She was a lector in the parish, and she came into the sacristy one day, and she washed her hands in the sink and went to get paper towels, and the paper towel dispenser was empty. And she just shouted out, she goes, oh, this parish is going to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, just angry about everything. And when she dealt with people who were pro-abortion, rather than trying to say things that would bring them around, she would simply just try to shut them down and say nasty things, calling them baby killers and stuff like that. You know, just language that doesn't help at all. And our pastor was not the type to really get up and speak boldly in defense of life. It was, of course, being controversial. He tried to, he would kind of just withdraw from that and only talk about the polite things, you know, the easy things to talk about. He didn't want to cause any controversy or anything. And some people gave him grief for that, including this woman who didn't like the idea that he would never talk about pro-life issues. And she came into the rectory one day with a stack of flyers that she wanted him to insert in the bulletin. And she actually said to him, and if you don't put these in the bulletin, the blood of every unborn baby that's killed is on your soul. Come on, that's nonsense. Okay? And that goes nowhere. That's not going to lead anybody who is pro-abortion to understand the dignity of a human life. Even the people who are opponents have the respect for life, and we must respect their life, that even they are children of God, misguided in their beliefs, yes, but still people we need to reach out to and call them away from their sins, just as John the Baptist, as Jesus reached out to the prostitutes and tax collectors, not just calling them sinners, but calling them back to the Lord. That's what we need to do with people who don't share our belief in the respect for human life. And so every single life in between, and not just the ones that address the hot topic issues, 
but every life we meet, including the people we know in our families, in our neighborhoods, in school, in our workplaces, the people that we find difficult. Sometimes there are some people that just make it hard for you to love them and hard to be charitable to them. It seems like they know exactly what to say or what to do to push every button and get you going. But even their life is sacred. Even their life must be respected. And so there's another one I think we can add into saying we must respect every life, whether it is no matter how uh, young it is, that it is unborn, no matter how ill it is, no matter how handicapped it is, no matter how criminal it is, and even no matter how annoying it is. Every human life, including our own, living our lives each and every day with respect for the gift of life that God has given us. There's been a lot of talk recently by many different groups about our lives matter, this life matters, that life matters, and they're all very right. They're absolutely true. Every life matters. But I challenge a lot of people who say that to look in the mirror and say, but your life matters. And live your life each and every day as if your life is important. As if your life is important to God and that you have something to do for God that only you can do. So our respect for life means not just the unborn, not just the handicapped, not just the criminal, not just the elderly, not just the annoying, but even our own lives. Every one of us is a sacred gift from God. May we never be able to be justly accused of hypocrisy, of saying that we respect one life but not another. But may we always have a consistent respect for every human life that exists, including the people who disagree with us and including the life of ourselves. May Jesus Christ be praised, now and forever.